All right, hello everyone. We're here for another installation of Intro to R. Um, so today we're going to be talking about lists and data frames, which are two pretty important data classes uh, to be able to deal with in um, R. So we're going to, you know, again, learn how to create them, understand vectorized calculations, uh, data classes, and uh, uh, indexing um, lists and data frames. Let's get started. So uh, first of all, we want to talk about data sets because it's it's really easy at this point. Now that we know a little bit more about data classes and things like that, we're going to start doing different things. Um, there are a bunch of data set sets in base R that you can actually use, and they're really, really easy to view. All you have to do is look at data, and this will pop all of the data sets up for you with their names and a little bit about them. Um, it's also really easy to load in our studios environment. You just want to give your data set name and then say force and that will force it into the global environment there. So if we want to have data, a bod, force, bod, there it is. Okay, so we look at this and it's time versus demand. Um, tooth growth is the same thing as a similar example. Uh, they're both data frames there. Um, okay, so lists and data frames. They're kind of similar, but uh, they're got, they have some important differences that you'll want to know going forward um, uh, before you use one or the other. Okay, so two very common classes uh, to deal with mixed data. So at this point, we've talked only about uh, types of data or classes of data um, that have non-mixed types. So they can ha all be numerical. Um, vectors can all be uh, uh, numerical, logical, complex, but they have to be of the same type. Uh, you can also have an array with with uh, 1D array with uh, characters, but again, it all has to be characters. It can't be like some characters and some numbers, but there are a lot of data that you generally want to mix uh, these types with, like a character description and a number associated with it. So the two um, very common classes for dealing with this are lists and data frames. Um, so lists and data frames can handle mixed data, but they come with some really important differences. Uh, to compare and contrast, I'm going to have you load the following data sets into our studio environment. Um, so there's going to be a list example. Uh, so right now, I'm going to clear everything out, clear this out, and I'm going to clear my environment out. And we're going to data ability cove, force that. OK. Uh, you'll notice that I can use uh, start filling in and use my arrow keys to, to fill stuff. Tooth growth, worse tooth, or use a tab key. All right, there we are. We have our tooth growth and our ability.cov. All right, so let's look at both of these. Let's talk, talk, let's talk about characteristics of lists first. First, um, here's a list that shows, shows a few examples. So we have this. Uh, ability.cov. All right, so each one of these elements is different. So let's can have as many elements as you'd like. So we're going to call each one of these three, three things elements of this list. Um, and so you can have the lists, uh, you can have each element of the list can be different sizes. So you'll notice that each one of these um, is a different size. It's uh, one, six, and then a matrix of six by six. Each element can be a different class. Uh, but within the element, they have to be the same classes. So this is really important. You'll notice that this is a matrix and they're here two vectors. Um, within the el element, they need to be uh, the same class, but they can be different amongst lists. And this is a really important difference between data frames and lists. Okay, so the difference of size and the difference of class. Um, each element can be a different data type. Okay, so uh, this you know, it's really important that uh, all three of these are devils, but you can have character val values, you can have logicals, all of that stuff is sort of stitched together as a list. And um, an element can even be another list. So lists are recursive. They can uh, list, 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 list uh, quite far down. I don't know how far they can go down, but they can re recurse upon themselves 
uh, as far, far down as you like. Lists are also primitive. So when we talk about primitive in R, we mean that most of that base code is written in C or Fortran, which makes it really, really fast. So since it's a primitive organization, a lot of calculations on lists will actually be significantly faster than uh, calculations on, say, data frames, which um, share some of it, ba it's base code in R, so it's non-primitive. So sometimes, the, for the most part, for you intro folks, that's not going to be as important. But um, when you get to the point where you're doing large amounts of data set data, and uh, maybe you need to do a lot of calculations on them, think about that. Um, so in contrast, data frames um, are a little bit different. Okay, so they uh, are limited to two D structures like matrices. Okay, so you can have like a number of columns and a number of rows, but you can't really have different stuff than that. Um, data frames can have different data types and different columns, but all each column has to be the same type. All of the elements within that column have to be the same type, okay? Um, data frames can have as many columns and rows as you'd like, but again, they have to have the same number of columns and rows, like a table uh, where you can't merge any of the cells or any of the columns together, okay? So it needs to be the square matrix of a you know, six by 10 or 60 by 30 or whatever, but all of that needs to be square and it needs to line up. So they have to have the same number of rows and columns throughout the data set. Uh, so, okay, so here's the first point where I want you to stop and check your understanding about this. Um, which class of objects would you need to use if you needed um, uh, members of different sizes? So members to be different classes or maybe both a and B, so they need to be different sizes and different classes. Would a list work? Yes or no. Would a data frame work? Yes or no for each one of those A, B, and C. So pause if you need to think about it just a little bit. Okay, so let's go through. Lists, members can be different sizes. Absolutely, data frame, not as much. The, the different columns um, need to be all uh, the same, you can have different columns, but the rows are all gonna need to be the same size. Number, members of different classes, both of them uh, can fulfill that, right? You can have different columns in a data frame, be different classes of data, but lists are all gonna need to be, uh, our lists can have um, different uh, members be different classes as well, both A and B. So if you need different sizes and different classes, a list is the way to go, okay? So not data frame, because that's uh, the size thing, um, trips trips people, uh, trips things up. Okay, so creating and viewing lists. Creating lists is easy with the list, <laughs> okay? So we can go ahead and create our list um, flop by using list. And so it's gonna be a matrix of data one to four, sequence one to four in row, I'm gonna want it to be two and column is gonna be two. And it has to be right because True, true, and hello. Okay, so here's our list flop. So anyway, um, just a, a, about the matrix, it has to be two by two because it's gonna be four numbers. So it has to be some multiple of, of that number, um, that total number, right? Okay, so flop, let's, let's look at this a little bit. You can inspect using view, which of course is just a click or view here. And you can see this, um, this uh, view of the data right there. Um, uh, uh, some interesting things, you'll see that it's kind of trying to help you out in terms of the members here, uh, inspecting individual members, you can use your list button. You can also like curse over here uh, and you can see this button pop up. And when you click that, it will give you the code for inspecting that individual member there. And so you can see that that's the matrix one, two, three, four that we created um, there, here. Flop two is going to be true, false, true, true. Okay, just like uh, our code says right here. Um, okay, and hello, of course, is just a character of one length, which is flop three, and it just says hello. Okay, so if you ever wonder about how to access a specific member in your list, uh, this is really helpful that our studio has just to click this button. Um, and the code, this again will give you the code of the the, the member reference. Um, so there are several ways of calling individual elements uh, of lists. Uh, so there is the way that we just said, double brackets give that information. This is like the most basic way to do it is, is double brackets with the number of the element there. 
Um, so you can do flop three, hello, flop one um, to get your matrix out. Uh, adding a single bracket will re reference an individual element of that member. Okay, so if we do flop two, double brackets, and then two in that, it's gonna say false because that was our true false is the second element of that. Um, and flop one, flop one and four is the fourth element, okay, which will be four. Uh, I believe that you can also use um, one, one. Uh, yeah, so that dimensionality uh, uh, within the dimensions, the, the row number and the column number as well will work, okay? So that's really good. So um, it behaves basically like taking uh, the, calling the member and then within that uh, referencing is about the same. So that's kind of useful. Um, if you want multiple members of a list, you can perform list slicing just by using uh, single bracket, brackets with a vector, okay? So single brackets for flop, and we just want elements two and three, okay? And it's gonna give us elements two and three, all right? Um, for easy reference, you can also name the members of your list, okay? So this is kind of a cool thing if you use the names and it's actually assigning this, uh, it's assigning the names to flop. You use the names of uh, function on this on the left-hand side. This is one of the few uh, places where you can um, uh, do this. So use a function on the left-hand side instead of the right-hand side of your uh, assign arrow. And uh, just make sure that you have the same number of uh, um, same numbers in your vector here, uh, your character vector, uh, assigning the names as your members of your list. So we can names, blob, whoops, here we go. So we're gonna do my matrix, which is the first is a matrix, my logicals, which is the second is logicals, and my string, which is a string, okay? And so now when you look, sometimes you have to Look at this. Okay, we've renamed the, the my matrix, my logicals, and my string. Okay, uh, you can reference each of these if they have a name using the dollar sign. All right, so flop my logicals is that great, which is really quite useful. Okay, list info. Information on lists is a bit different than other classes, and mostly this is because they have, uh, they allow for those different sizes, uh, different numbers of elements, and different classes of elements. So something like dim is not always going to work, right? Because dim doesn't work on vectors; it works on matrices and uh, arrays. So you have to be a little bit careful about what you use and what you're after. So if you want to use length, it's going to give you the the length is going to give you the number of members of that list, not uh, anything about the members of those lists. And um, again, if you use dim on flop, it doesn't really have dimensions, so it's going to give you a null. So it's just telling you, like, I don't really know what to do with that, and I'm going to return nothing for you. Um, but you can also use these same functions on individual members and get more information that way. So if you do the dim on uh, your matrix, my matrix. Of course, that is a matrix, so it will give you two, two, the dimensions of that matrix. And the length of uh, my string, which is the member, the third member, um, is just one, right? Because it's just the word hello. Okay, modifying lists, super duper easy. All, did, all you need to do to add members is simply adding a new number or name to the, the list, okay? So we can add to flop four, and then you know, just to say, okay, well, I want four. This is the fourth member of this list, and it's just going to be a vector of um, some numbers, okay? And once you do that, you can see that four now shows up. It doesn't have a name. That's okay, right? But it shows up as a double um, uh, vector uh, of these five numbers. Great. Um, you can also, <laughs> I don't know how loopy I was when I wrote this. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, and again, if you look at flop again, you can see flop um, shows up there as well. Uh, adding elements to each member depends on the data type of the member, of course. Uh, you're going to want to be careful there because you could probably add uh, ha ha he he to blip, right? So if I use the second element, um, he, that will work just fine. 
Okay, so ha ha he he. Now it's like character like two. Okay, so that's not really all that different than how you would add to each individual data type. You just need to make sure that you're adding to a list in a way that's appropriate for the data type itself. So that's what you have to keep in mind. Okay, so check your understanding. Here's a little bit of a long one. I want you to create a single list in which each member of that list contains at least uh, one, each of the data types that we've learned so far in the course. So the tonic data types and also the different other data types. Okay, so go ahead and do that because um, do it in one big uh, line of code uh, and you know, it would probably be easiest to use a script for this one. Okay, so pause here if you need to do it. You should really just sit down and try to do it. All right, moving on. Creating data frames. So now we're going to move over into talking about data frames, which again, it's a little bit less different than lists, but has a lot of similarities. So you're going to create a data frame using data.frame, which is, you know, pretty straightforward. So my data frame, data.frame, I'm going to do x equals 3.2, 5.4, 5.4, 2.4, 3.2, 3.2. Seven point eight, and then a comma. So what I'm doing is is I'm creating x equals, and then this is a whole vector, right? And then a comma, y equals as, a, and each one of these is going to be a different column. Okay, the way you set this up. Three, two point nine, four point one. Okay, and then condition is going to equal c t f t t f. Okay, so when you hit enter, um, that's going to create my data frame right here. Okay, so it's uh, values for x and y, and then this condition. Um, data frames report observations. Uh, so each one of these rows is an observation in which you have make observations on whatever x, y, and then the condition of that. Uh, as well. So you can think of the columns as your types of observations, right? And then the rows as the observations, the data themselves, okay? Uh, you can sort, um, you can set column names during the data frame construction. You can see that I set this as X, Y, and this condition. You don't have to, you can just leave um, X equals off and, and create uh, just string together three different um, vectors here to create your data frame without doing that. But you can also rename using call names. Uh, you can actually rename using call uh, row names as well. So if you'd like to name those rows instead of just having them be uh, you know, a sequence of numbers from one to whatever, you can actually use row names as well. But you can rename the columns. I'm not going to do this because uh, it's kind of silly. And I'd rather just stick my x, y in condition for now. There are a lot of ways of indexing data within data frames. This gets a little bit on the silly side. The number of ways you can pull data out from a data frame, they are not, while they will get you to the same output, they are not equivalent in terms of how difficult they are uh, and how fast they are. There's actually ways of doing it that are faster than others. Now, for intro people, if you're just doing regular stuff, you shouldn't need to worry about this. It's only when you get to optimization and sort of advanced coding that you need to worry about that. But similar to matrices, you can specify row and column positions with square brackets. So if you want to do my data frame and access the second row and the third column, you can do that and that's false, right? It's the second row and the third column, which is here. Uh, you can also use double square brackets to call columns. So this is really useful sometimes when you don't wanna specify the name of that column. Um, or you may want to specify the name of the column, but you can't use, there are certain instances with, uh, with coding that you can't use the, um, the dollar sign appropriately. So you can do Y, okay, so within those double square brackets, you can do that. Uh, you can also do a single element by, again, using a square bracket on the other side of those square brackets. So you're calling this whole column and then saying, I want the fourth element of that column. Um, you can also use a dollar sign. This is a really common way, I feel like, of doing it. Um, this definitely makes the most sense, I feel like, too. It's the easiest to understand. But all of these, again, are going to result in the same sort of output, okay? Um, 
Some are faster than others. Again, you don't really have to worry about that now, but if you're into optimization, uh, you can figure that out, uh, uh, which one's the fastest one by micro pinching. Um, here's uh, a great, uh, I don't remember where I got this, unfortunately, but I think it's so great because first of all, it's super nerdy. And second of all, it's sort of, lays out all of the different ways that you can index um, data from uh, from a data frame. Okay, so it creates a simple data frame right here. And then this is all the different ways you could do it. Please don't do this. This is like not reasonable at all. Like chaotic neutral is okay, but like this is not reasonable. This actually is like not reasonable <laughs> either. But um, yeah, again, there, there's a bunch of different ways. So I think this is actually kind of cool to remind you of all the different ways that you can actually get data from a specific, uh, uh, from a specific data frame. Okay, modifying data frames is really similar to modifying less, but uh, also uh, has some ad additional helpful functions as well. So um, adding a column name is or adding another column is easy as just giving it a name and assigning it some information. So we can do metric, um, which is gonna be a sequence of one, two, five. Okay, so now just slaps on an extra column to the end. Uh, there's ways of uh, rejiggering the order of columns and stuff like that, but we're not gonna worry about it right now. Um, Remember that the new column though is really important. Remember these things cannot be different links, right? So if you wanna set a new column, you have to have it the same number of rows as the uh, original data frame. So you can't go using six rows like here. What happens when you do that? It just gives you an error, okay? So the error is saying um, replacement has six rows and data has five. It's just saying, you have to have the same number of rows as everything else, conform, conform. Um, anyway, if you get this uh, error, that's what that means, right? It's just trying to tell you like, look, you're trying to put six elements where I only have space for five, which is not a big deal. Just reduce the number. Um, you can add multiple rows by using row bind. So row bind is kind of cool because it binds by rows. So it binds rows together. So if you look at um, my data frame, I'm gonna do the one and do R bind. Uh, you can actually bind uh, data together. So what I'm going to do is bind two data, my data frames together in rows, and you'll see that it goes from five observations to 10 observations. And what it's done is just gone one, two, three, four, and then uh, bound these by rows. So in the row direction and just slapped on another full matrix uh, or another full um, set of rows here. Uh, one through five. Okay, so that's a row bind, which is really, really useful. You can add columns together by C bind. So let me do this. I'm going to do my data frame two and you C bind. C stands for columns and you can do the same thing. My data frame and my data frame. Okay. And when you do that, you'll notice that it goes from it, the number of observations to the number of rows doesn't change, right? Because we're actually sticking them together like this, uh, but the number of columns goes from four to eight. And if you look at here, it's got X, Y, condition metric, X, Y, condition metric. Okay, so it's, it's just literally stitched them together uh, with the columns. Why would you wanna do that? I don't know, but if you need to do it, then now you know. Uh, okay, so there are some helpful functions for data frames that will make life a bit easier for you. Um, to print out the first few lines of a data frame, you can use the command head. Data frame one. Okay, so that pulls like about the six first six lines. You can see the first six. Uh, it also gives you the names of the columns if you have those. If you would like, uh, and oh yeah, we have the head of the, that tooth growth is pretty long in terms of that. Uh, so the, to the total length of tooth growth is like 60 and this is pulling the first 10, the first six out for you. You can also print the last few lines of a data frame out with tail. Okay, so it's again, it's gonna give you the column names there. And then those last, so it's giving you 60, the last six here, okay, um, that are associated with that. These actually work for other data classes as well, but typically um, I'm using it mostly with data frames, okay. 
uh, print out a summary of the elements in the data frame. This is one of my favorite, favorite commands, okay, because it gives you the summary of each of the columns of this data frame based on the, all the rows being observations. It automatically summarizes each column. You don't have to tell it to do that. And the summary statistics are appropriate for the data type. If you see here, um, the length of that tube, uh, tooth uh, measurements. Um, it's giving you the minimum, the first quantile, the median, the mean, the third quantile, and the max of those measurements because it's treating it like a numeric. Um, same thing with dose. Okay, it's treating it like numer numeric, but SUP is uh, the supplement type um, that they gave these is actually a factor. And we'll talk about factors next time. Um, but this is the appropriate, it's giving you the count number for each of one of these factors in the data set, which is really, really cool. So anytime you do that, um, it's going to uh, give you this nice little summary. So if you need to do the mean quickly, um, do the max min quickly, summary is all you need. And it does works on large data sets as well. Okay, so in the tooth growth data set, how can you print out all of the measured tooth lengths from their study? Just the tooth lengths. Um, second, how can you find the mean and standard deviation of these lengths? Go ahead and write the code out for each one of these. Okay, take a second and do it. If you have questions, go ahead and ask during class uh, the next time we meet. But that's it. Uh, so right now I want you, uh, now that you've completed this video, there's assignments 1.10 and 1.11 for you and also read Tavies chapter six for next time. But that is all for me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it and keep on coding.